Today, we're very delighted to present to you some of the work we have been doing on the use of artificial intelligence in updating ESCO. This work started roughly over one year ago, and today we will present you our work, and this is divided in four parts that you can see here. In the first part, my colleague Chiara is going to discuss the work that has been done specifically for version ESCO v1.1. In the next section, we'll discuss some of the work that is ongoing and that will impact future versions of ESCO. In the third part, we will discuss related data science activities that are strongly connected with updating the taxonomy. And the last part, we discuss synergies with other projects. Hello everyone, I'm Chiara. So uh, we will now discuss what is the work that we have done for the update of ESCO, so for ESCO v1.1 using data science. We will go through four macro topics. The first one is how we tried to detect potentially duplicate skills. Then we will talk about relationship, the first one between skills and occupations, and the second one between skills. Finally, we will go through the methodology that we have used to label green skills and knowledge concepts. Let's start with the first one. Here, we try to detect duplicate skills in ESCO. Now, as you know, the ESCO skills pillar is very big. It's a large size data set. We have more than 15,000 skills and knowledge concepts. So what happens here is that it may have happened and it actually happened in the past that more experts propose skills that are specific to occupations, but that overall in the whole data set may sound duplicates, which means that they have a very similar meaning. What we are trying to do now is to detect those duplicates and to avoid having them. So our steps are as follow. We started with the new transversal skills. In fact, following the work on the transversal skills, we added new concepts. And our aim was to avoid that these new concepts would have been already covered by other skills, hence adding duplicates to the classification. So what we have done is to use the preferred term and the description of the transversal skills as input. Then we use the model that we have developed that uses semantic similarity. Basically, our model is trained on a large amount of text data and is now able to look at the similarity in terms of semantics between different texts. Using, again, as I said, the transversal skills as input and the ESCO skills as output, we see which ones are the ESCO skills that are the most similar to the new skills. For example, what you see here on the top is a good match between accept constructive criticism and old ESCO skills and accept criticism and guidance a new ESCO transversal skill. Since we consider this as a duplicate, we consider as obsolete, accept constructive criticism. And this you will find in the Delta file signed as obsolete. Next example is to identify relations between skills and occupations. So what we have done here is to look at ESCO skills that currently are not mapped to any occupations. So they are there in the classification with all the proper data, preferred term, description, but they are not linked to any occupation. We call such skills orphans. What we want to do here is to try to link such skills to ESCO occupations. For doing it, again, we have used our semantic similarity model but also we have used vacancies from the EURES portal. Now, EURES is a portal of the European Union where public employment services from member states can upload vacancies. They have shared with us a number of vacancies and what we can see there is that some European, European member states that are already using ESCO are already mapping some ESCO occupations with these skills that for us are orphans. So using these two data, on one hand, the machine learning uh, model that we have developed, and on the other hand, 
the frequency of the relationship between orphan skills and occupations in the vacancies, we are able, we were able to link orphan skills to ESC occupations, as you see in the black box. Now, the next example is to identify relations between skills. In the ESCO classification, skills can also have relationship among themselves. For example, one skill can be broader or more general compared to another skill, but both of them can be very relevant for the labour market. What happens there is that we consider the more general skill broader, or also called parent. The more specific skill is called narrower or also child. Now, when we introduced the new transversal skills in ESCO, we wanted to see whether these skills could be considered as broader to other ESCO, con to other ESCO concepts, such as non-transversal skills. Here again, we have used our machine learning model that, is, that was this time trained on already existing broader, narrower relationships in ESCO. Then putting the new transversal skills at its input, we output, we use as output the ESCO non-transversal skills. And for example, what you find in the black boxes are the relationship broader, narrower that we have accepted. Now, the final topic of this list of four is the labeling part. How did we define one ESCO skill or knowledge as green? We followed a three steps approach. The first one is the manual labeling. The ESCO team used the definition in the bottom left from SEDEFO of green skills, which says the knowledge, abilities, values, and attitudes needed to live in, develop, and support a society, which reduces the impact of human activity on the environment. Then we took the whole ESCO dataset and manually, one by one, we defined if, based on such definition, the skill could have been considered green or not. The second step involved a machine learning classifier. We have trained such classifier on a large amount of data from different sources, being other classifications from the European Union or out of the European Union, from other European, um, other European work available, such as the EU taxonomy, very relevant in these days, or also from job vacancies. So the classifier has learned to classify as green skills compared to other non-green skills. More is available in our report. Finally, the step three was to compare the list of green skills resulting from step one and step two. In the bottom right, you can see an example of the of what we got when comparing the two distribution. Now I leave the floor back to Jan. So in the next part of the of the um, presentation, we will provide you some use cases on how we're using AI today and how it will impact future versions of ESCO. The first use case is to identify potential MPTs of new occupations. As you know, when we propose new occupations, we need to provide a preferred term for them and we need to provide a description for them. So on the bottom left, you can see that in this case, the occupation mobility services manager was provided together with the corresponding description. But apart from these two data fields, we also need to provide alternative labels for these uh, new occupations. To this end, we used a machine learning driven approach. So what we did was using a machine learning model that takes the preferred term as input together with the description and maps it to a space of job titles. So these job titles were extracted again from Euros vacancies. Here you can see on the right, the top three job titles from URS that match this input. So the top match was a mobility manager. Then we had mobility program coordinator and then campus mobility planning manager. So first of all, the top match mobility manager was also proposed by experts. So this provides great feedback also on the model. 
The next one, Mobility Program Coordinator, was not suggested by experts, but it was included after we analyzed and validated it. The third example, Campus Mobility Plan Planning Manager, was not included, although being a good match, mainly because it was a, because it was a more narrow version of this uh, occupation. The next use case is related to improving the allocation of ESCO occupations in the hierarchy. This slide provides an overview of all the ESCO occupations that belong to two ESCO groups, namely the group 35 and group 25, which are the ICT professionals and the IC technicians. So the goal of this analysis was to quantify whether these ESCO occupations are sitting in the correct ESCO groups and also how they relate to other ESCO occupations inside an ESCO group. Let us look at two specific examples here. So in the middle, you can see here the um, occupation ICT Auditor Manager. Officially, this one belongs to the group 2519, which is the group of the software and application developers and analysts not elsewhere classified. So based on a machine learning model, which was trained on ESCO, we would normally be able to perfectly replicate the clusters that we already have in ESCO. So what we did here was ingesting additional data coming from online job vacancies, adding it to the model training to see how these data impact the space that you can see here. So what happened was after ingesting um, data from online job vacancies, the ICT auditor manager, which should fit in the box of 2519, was pulled out of the cluster and moved to uh, a part of the space where it got very close to the IT auditor, which is in fact, um, so the ICT auditor manager is in fact the management role of the IT auditor. So we could see here that based on data from vacancies, we would get different relations between these occupations, as you could see here. Another example here is related to um, the group of the systems analysts. So what we did was quantifying how much spread, how much variance there is in these ESCO groups. And group 2511, as you can see here, had the highest intra-cluster dispersion. So you can also see this on uh, this plot that it's more spread out of all clusters. In combination with the fact that this also is a cluster with the shortest distance compared to all other clusters, this is telling us that this group contains a quite a variable mix of occupations. So what we noticed was that based on these um, uh, data, that there started to appear additional clusters within ESCO groups and potentially clusters which we do not have in ESCO today. So for instance, here at the bottom left, you can see that there was popping up a space of more data related uh, occupations like a data analyst, a data scientist, which uh, sit in uh, this 2511 cluster, but also a data quality specialist, a knowledge engineer, and an ICT intelligence systems designer. So this methodology allows us to investigate clusters, which we have today in ESCO, and it provides us all the information to eventually, if necessary, adjust the grouping. The next use case is about detecting quality issues. So on the left, you can see the topic of representativeness of occupation titles. So here you can see the um, uh, occupation of an ICT intelligence systems designer. So as you can see, this occupation has a wide variety of different alternative titles. And what we did was quantify, again, based on US vacancies, how frequent these job titles, uh, how frequent these appear as job titles in vacancies. So this provides us direct KPIs on how representative the preferred terms and the alternative terms in ESCO are in the labor market. What we also did was using the input here, the description of the uh, occupation together with all the alternative labels as input to the same model that uh, we've shown before to map that to the space of job titles. So this is a way 
to identify potentially new job titles from the labor market for an existing ESCO concept. So here for this example, you could see that the model was suggesting machine learning related uh, job titles. The example on the right is a way to create or test clusters. So it means um, it's similar to what we've shown before with the ISCO and uh, ESCO uh, group analysis, but this time we're looking inside one single ESCO occupation. So for instance, all these um, job titles or alternative titles in this box, these are all alternative titles for, this, for the same um, ESCO occupation, that of a data scientist. There is one um, alternative title here, the data engineer, which falls outside that box. So it's a pretty much an outlier compared to all the other um, alternative labels for this concept. So again, here the model is telling us that this is probably not the best possible alternative job title for the role uh, for the occupation of a data scientist. And you could see that the model was positioning it closer to other alternative titles like a data warehouse developer. And if you would uh, compare the description of a data house where dev warehouse developer with it, you would see that this is indeed a role which is more related to uh, the ETL processes of developing software and building data pipelines, similar to the, what the, the data engineer is doing in practice. So this is again a way for us to test um, our clusters that we have in ESCO. And the last example is about supporting experts comparing external sources to existing ESCO concepts. So as you know, we use feedback from uh, experts, like for instance, blueprint projects to improve ESCO. So this means that these organizations or from these projects were getting um, descriptions of potentially new skills. So here you can see for a blueprint project from the construction sector that the term mine energy saving potential regarding human behavior was suggested. So one of the first things that we need to do when we get this type of feedback is to figure out whether something similar is already present in ESCO today. So what we did was using a machine learning model to map that piece of free text to the ESCO skills. And here on the right, you can see the top three ESCO skills that the model thinks are similar. So you can see here that the top match was analyze energy consumption. And with that information, we could go back to the blueprint project to um, actually manually validate those results. So using a machine learning model here, provides uh, an efficient approach to automatically come up with suggestions and that can be then discussed with the, with the Blueprint project. So we would like to um, in the future follow this approach with more uh, of these expert organizations. Well, now um, we want to show you some other data science activities we are doing. These, of course, are not specifically related to uh, updating or maintaining the classification, but they do have a strong impact indirectly to our activities and to the ESCO classification. We will go through three uh, of the projects we are doing. The first one is a pilot project to link learning outcomes to ESCO skills. The second one uh, is a crosswalk we are building between the ESCO classification and the ONET classification in the US. And finally, we will show you some supporting materials and visual tools that we have available in our portal. Starting with the learning outcomes. This is a pilot project we are already running since a couple of years. And every once in a while, so usually every year, we do update. Uh, the machine learning models that are behind the suggestions. Uh, these pilot projects um, are available for those who want to participate, so uh, they can contact um, the ESCO secretariat and then they can join the project. What happens is that those who participate should upload their qualifications. So the first it was um, qualification providers from the member states, now we are also open to private implementers who again are education providers. And then uh, once they upload a qualification, uh, our uh, application 
distinguishes between the different learning outcomes splitting the text and then each learning outcomes is uh, linked to ESCO occupations. Then those who join the pilot uh, should accept or reject the proposed link with ESCO occupation with ESCO skills. Sorry. Uh, so uh, for each text, you have different options. You have the machine learning uh, algorithm, which match matches this text using uh, different models behind. Um, and then you also have the API search, which is the same uh, search that you would have as a result if you use the, the search bar in the ESCO portal. And finally, you can browse yourself our classification to pick the skill that you prefer. Then the second activity is a crosswalk between ESCO and ONET. This is a collaboration that we have with the U.S. Department of Labor and um, it started in 2021, is going on in 2022 and the aim is to publish the result by the end of this year. Uh, what is going on here is that we are mapping the occupations from ONET to the occupation pillar of ESCO. Um, here we use two main parts within the methodology. One is the machine learning part, so our model using semantic similarity. And the second part is the human labeling process. So um, what happens is that we take as input the ONET title of, of the occupation and the description of the occupation. Then we go through uh, the machine learning model and the output are the ESCO occupations that are ranked as the closest semantically to the input. Then in the human labeling part, we pick up the top 10 um, occupations and we go through a number of labels. So we can choose whether the occupation of ESCO, the suggested one, is an exact match to the ONET one, or whether it's a good match but still not perfectly the same. Because for example, the ONET occupation could have a broader scope or a narrower one compared to the ESCO occupation. This is specified when we do the labeling part. Then this validation goes to our colleagues from the US Department of Labor, and then they do a final round of validation. Again, these results will be available in our portal. Finally, here is a couple of examples of supporting materials that we have in our portal. On the left, you see the skill occupation matrix table. What we have here for the tables is to connect um, occupations and skills in ESCO, not just at the most granular level, so one occupation is linked with a number of skills, but even at a higher levels within the hierarchies. So, for example, one group at the level two of the occupation hierarchy, how this group is linked to skill at the first level of the skills hierarchy. What you see in the graph in particular is the level one of the ESCO hierarchy, so of the occupation hierarchy, versus the level one of the skill hierarchy. What we show based on colors is the frequency of skills within one occupation group. So you can read it horizontally. What we shared in our portal is an explanation, a technical report, this visual tool, and if you want to contact us, we will also share the Python code we have used. On the right, you can see a representation of an embedding space clustering together occupation. Now, what we wanted to look at here is how occupations are related between them, comparing how they are mapped within the ESCO hierarchy and how they are close together in job vacancies. So for the ESCO hierarchy part, we use colors, which means that when you see the same color, it means that the, these occupations are mapped within the same ESCO hierarchy. Of course, we did a selection. So we picked the second level of the hierarchy and just groups among them. Then what you see sitting close physically, so within the graph, then are the occupations that are the most similar within the job vacancies, the one that usually sit together. 
So for example, if you see cluster of occupations that have different colors and that are very close uh, together in this embedding space, this may mean different things. For example, uh, the mapping of these occupations in the skills in the occupation hierarchy could be reviewed. Or in a different way, this means that we could also provide a different representation, close, similar to the occupational hierarchy, but giving some differences in the data. I mean, these are all different opportunities we have ahead, and we wanted to, to show you uh, some, some things that are still possible. You can look at the occupation embedding space in our news items. In the last part of this presentation, we'll discuss synergies with other projects, more specifically with URES and the member state mapping tables, which is also related to the work of URES, and finally Europass. So as Kiad already mentioned, we're using online job vacancies coming from the URES portal. So on this slide, you can see at the top right, in this box, a, dis a description of a vacancy which was orig originally in German. So here we translated it to English for ease of representation. So at the bottom here, you can see the different skills from ESCO and the different ESCO occupations that are also attached to this online job vacancy. So in the middle, you can see here in this box, the original job title from the vacancy, which was a C and C Fraser. So these blue boxes, these were the ESCO occupations that the person that created this vacancy labeled uh, this vacancy with. So it's a fitter and turner, a milling machine operator, and a tool and die maker. Then we also added to this graph the ESCO skills that the creator of this vacancy attached to this vacancy. So here, these are all skills that were added to the vacancy. And you could see here the relations that they have with the different ESCO occupations. So for instance, program a CNC controller was added to this vacancy. And this is a skill that in ESCO is also part of the profile or the occupation of a tool and die maker. But it's also a skill that is connected to a milling machine operator. On the right here, you can see a number of skills which were attached to this vacancy. But, but which are today not yet connected to any of these three ESCO occupations. So this is just one example, but we have this kind of data um, on a large scale. So obviously when we would be able to uh, merge all that information from all these different vacancies, we would be able to find very interesting patterns, seeing patterns coming back from different geographical lo uh, locations, seeing patterns coming back from different um, vacancy providers. So that provides us good evidence to start investigating whether we might be missing relations between occupations and skills, for instance, and also provides us good insight about which occupations are related and which skills are related. The second use case is uh, related to member state mapping tables. So there is an ongoing exercise of um, the member states to map their national classifications to ESCO. And here you can see an example of the Netherlands mapping their occupation classification, which you can see here on the right, to the ESCO classification here on the left. So together with these kind of mappings, they also provide a type of match that is so, for instance, a narrow match, a broad match, an exact match, or a close match. So this uh, kind of information is obviously very useful for us to update ESCO because based on it, we can identify missing occupations. We could potentially identify more um, and narrow occupations of what we have today in ESCO. So having this available for all the member states is a great resource for us to maintain ESCO in the future. And then the last use case is Europass. So Europass is a platform uh, from the European Commission. And the goal of Europass is, is offering the citizens a way to create a profile online. And that is largely based on ESCO. So what you can see here is on the left, the UI where people 
can enter their ethical skills when they build up their profile. So on the left, you can see where they add these skills to their profile. Here on the right, you can see where they create their work history descriptions. So again, they can check and um, use ESCO occupations, as you can see here. On the bottom right, we have the digital skills um, that people can enter in their profile. So this is also a great way for us to um, detect, for instance, new digital skills, which we do not have yet in ESCO, that we might need to consider to add to the taxonomy. So these kind of data are becoming available on a European scale, which means they're coming from millions of experts who are actually doing or having these occupations. So this is superb user feedback on ESCO, and we could potentially extract lots of uh, links between occupations and skills, or between skills and skills and occupations and occupations for updating and maintaining ESCO. We've come to the end of the presentation, so we would like to thank you. If you want more information, you can have a look at our website on our, um, or on our forum. We have lots of um, news articles related to data science, and we're always available for a conversation if you have additional questions. Thank you. Thank you.